me to do introductions. Um, so uh, we're delighted to have Irina here, Irina Gurevich. Um, uh, Irina has done many, many, many things. Uh, I will give you a brief potted uh, history. Um, so she's a, a professor at uh, TU Darmstadt, um, where she directs the uh, Ubiquitous Knowledge Processing, UKB uh, lab. Um, she uh, works uh, broadly across NLP. Um, she claims herself that she's uh, her main, her main research interest in machine learning and uh, for large scale la language understanding and text semantics. Um, but I, I think you'd be hard put to find a task that she hasn't worked on at, at some point. Uh, um, she has very broad interests. Um, she's uh, received lots of awards, so she's an ACL Fellow. Uh, um, she was the first ever. Uh, Hessian uh, Lover Distinguished uh, Chair, which uh, is a very, very big deal. Uh, she um, co-directs the NLP program within uh, ELLIS, uh, which is a, um, a European uh, network of excellence in machine learning. Um, she's uh, Vice President of ACL, she keeps me sane. <laughs> um, uh, she also very recently won an, an ERC Advanced Grant, um, which relates to what you're talking about today, or no? Um, it's different indirectly. It's yeah, different okay. Different. <laughs> anyway, without further ado. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot, uh, Tim, for your great introduction. So we are competing for the breadth of talking <laughs> and, and me, so uh, I wonder <laughs> who's winning. Hard to say. Anyhow, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, welcome uh, to my talk. For sure, in the recent uh, years, many of us, I think uh, any person in this audience has had some kind of debate related to COVID-19 and this conversation um, could go as follows. The vaccines aren't safe. My uncle died after getting the shot. And um, there's another person saying, what? Study X proves they are safe. That's the truth. Well, Oh, that's not my truth, right? Sounds familiar, such a conversation. Uh, humans like uh, to debate a lot, and we live um, in a world which is becoming ever more complex. So there are many controversial topics. And worse than that, there's a lot of unreliable information we have to read and understand. And this is the task which is very, very difficult um, for the humans. So this talk will um, be about how to detect, how to verify, and how to communicate um, about real-world misinformation. And as a very last minute, just today in the morning, I crossed out verify and put debunk uh, in line with our most recent uh, research results. And this is because what I'm presenting today um, is not an off-the-shelf solution, so that, that's really work in progress. It's an ongoing research project, so in some places I might be not very confident about how to interpret the results. So it, it's meant to be as a ground for discussion today. So uh, let's have a look at a real-life example. We see a tweet, and that tweet uh, spreads misinformation about coronavirus vaccines and a false uh, cure. So it says uh, chloroquine is a potent inhibitor of SARS coronavirus, blah, blah, blah. And it also points to a scientific study in this uh, link uh, here. And this is um, an interesting detail because this uh, link to a scientific study um, makes it kind of credible to a person looking at the tweet. So the person can be easily led to believe that uh, this tweet is grounded in medical and scientific evidence. I will come back to that later. And of course, misinformation can have very serious uh, consequences resulting uh, in death, resulting in polarization of public opinions or even military uh, conflicts. It's if it's spread well enough with viral effects. So, it's extremely important to be able to fact check information very quickly. So the speed is very important. So we need to adapt to ever changing planes made on social media. And that's why we need NLP to support fact checkers. And this talk is about how to improve this process. Now, machine learning and NLP are very powerful 
uh, tools for combating misinformation. If we make certain assumptions and we have certain resources, if we know what fake news typically look like, we can teach models uh, to recognize it. However, um, fake news change all the time. So whenever something happens in the world, we have a new topic and that topic is entering the arena and uh, the learning process is very expensive. Uh, so the question is how can we adapt to new examples of false information efficiently and effectively? Uh, to help with this, uh, researchers create data sets to train our models, but these data sets are very expensive uh, to make, so it takes also a lot of time. So what's worse than that, as I will show, very often the data sets are not representative of reality, so they are not realistic. And uh, we also must acknowledge that fact-checking is not just about uh, what is truth and what not. So that's why my introductory conversation, that's not my truth. It's also uh, to a great extent about how can we uh, convince people uh, to change their mind. So this is what is a real challenge because psychologists have uh, shown that just giving the facts, the right facts, is not enough for people to change their minds. So we need some to understand the mechanism why people believe certain things in order to be able to um, rebut that. So we need effective, uh, persuasive strategies um, to encourage fake new news believers to have a change of their mind. So. Um, my group has approached this complex problem of combating real-world uh, misinformation with NLP from three different and complementary perspectives that I'm going to cover in my talk today. So first, detecting uh, harmful content efficiently and testing this on realistic data. Uh, second, uh, debunking uh, false information. And here we mainly analyzed existing data sets and made important observations in order to um, define the research gap and uh, the promising future research direction. And finally, I'm going to talk a project which is about uh, these effective communication strategies and how to respond and rebut to false information, which we are working on together with uh, cognitive scientists from the University of Bristol. So in the first part, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, detecting um, harmful content, uh, which is the first step of this whole uh, pipeline. Harmful content comes in a large variety of forms and all the time, as I've already explained, new topics emerge that we have not previously seen in uh, our training data. So adapting to new topics and domains is uh, very crucial for detecting false information. And uh, the existing systems tend to become ever more complex. So this is what Oshikawa and Al show in their survey. And the two main problems with the existing state-of-the-art approaches is that they gener uh, generalize poorly uh, to new uh, data and also they overfit um, uh, to their uh, training data. And another problem is that uh, they are uh, not efficient because uh, Current systems are based on transformers and uh, transformers are expensive. So you need to retrain them. So that requires a lot of computation. So our goal in this part of my uh, presentation uh, to create an approach which is more efficient than existing techniques based on transformers and that can generalize better uh, without any expensive retraining. So let's consider an example. Uh, taken from our data set where an existing model has seen harmful and neutral examples about COVID vaccine. So um, the harmful one is the government discriminates against the unvaccinated. They'll send us to prison camps and take away our rights. So that's the harmful. And um, the neutral is vaccination reduces death and hospitalization um, rates. Now we have a new example, 
refugees from Ukraine face heavy discrimination in Poland. They are basically treated like prisoners with no rights. So the task of the system is now to identify this example as being harmful or uh, neutral. Um, so when it's introduced to this new example, the model could struggle uh, to determine our label because the topic is quite different uh, from the training data that the system is familiar with. Um, so instead of uh, retraining, our system can um, then try to aid the decision process by reminding the existing model of the most similar example it has seen. So this is a lot like the government discriminates against the unvaccinated, they'll send us to prison camps and take away our rights. So it's a lot like the first example in terms of similarity, though it's a completely different topic. And this way, uh, the system could um, make a prediction that this new um, piece of information is potentially a harmful um, uh, case of um, the false, in, in, uh, false claim. So this is the intuition behind that. So as I said, the current state of the art systems in NLP are based on transformers, for example, BERT. Um, and these models are very powerful and effective in modeling this and other kinds of NLP problems. However, they are very uh, computationally expensive to use and to retrain. Um, about uh, three years ago, uh, our group has created an alternative to transformers called sentence transformers or SBIRT. So this work is very widely used in the community. It creates a semantically rich representation of text in form of dense high dimensional uh, vectors using transformer based Siamese networks optimized via cosine similarity. And these vectors can be used to train simpler uh, learners that are cheaper than uh, transformers computationally. However, uh, there's a major problem uh, with SBIRT representations. In particular, they are fixed and they are not optimizable for a given end task. That's where our ongoing work, uh, SetFit, comes in, which is a joint project uh, between my lab, uh, Intel AI, and uh, the Hugging Face. SetFit optimizes um, an SBIRT model using a paradigm from uh, computer vision, which is called contrastive fine tuning. We can use this updated model and reap the benefits of both transformers and cheaper learning algorithms. In this way, SetFit makes sentence transformers um, a viable paradigm for end to end learning. So we can adapt uh, to our end task with this um, um, training procedure. So here we can see uh, the results, uh, how SetFit is competitive with uh, GPT-3, which is a huge uh, language model. Um, on the RAFT benchmark, uh, RAFT is the benchmark for few shot uh, text classification. And SetFit performs comparably on average uh, to this very large language model. However, it is much less expensive. So it's 1.6 thousand times less expensive than the GPT-3 uh, model. And SetFit uh, is very well performing um, in the few shot uh, domain. However, as you can see in the graph, it reaches a plateau with more training examples. So after that, it's not improving. And if we compare this to the transformer performance on the same data set, we can see that the transformer is more expensive. Um, and uh, it does not perform as well as SetFit when it has less training data. However, Transformer is a strong learner. So as we get more annotated data, it's getting stronger. So um, as I said, we need to retrain uh, the Transformer models for a large number of instances all the time, so which is prohibitively expensive. Now, um, the question we are asking, can we have the best of both worlds. So can we combine SetFit and Transformers and can we use these tools in order to adapt uh, well uh, to emerging 
harmful content like misinformation. So we combine SetFit and Transformer into one system. So real world uh, data is growing all the time. So we don't um, need to keep retraining expensive models. However, we can use our inexpensive pre-trained embedding model like Esper and encode new examples. And then we can compare uh, them with the data that BERT uh, has already seen. So more formally, the approach works like this. First, we optimize our embedding and classifier on a small subset of data. Uh, so I call it set fit one and transform one. So these are optimized. Um, we then embed new test data with the updated embedding model set fit one. We then do a similarity lookup and concatenate the most similar uh, training and test example uh, together. And then we predict with a frozen transformer model, the transformer one created in step one, um, showing it the most similar example it has seen before together with a new example in a pair. So here you can see some uh, overview of our current results. As I said, this is work in progress and we're conducting more experiments. So in the middle, transformer and set fit uh, represents to just uh, purely using either a transformer-based model or the set fit approach. And we have uh, four different uh, system configurations where we are training on uh, more and more examples. So in the first step, for example, we are training on 100 um, examples. And then we have uh, two models created by ourselves. So this is the first line, which is a more advanced baseline. And this is the approach which I have just described in the previous slide. So a set fit one plus KNN um, updates the sentence transformer embedding model in the first step with 100 examples, and then it is frozen. And we use a K nearest neighbors classifier for making the prediction. So this is basically the similarity system that plugs into ours and serves as an advanced baseline. So, um, what we can see in the results is that um, um, set fit uh, start, starts stronger than the transformer. As I said, in low resource settings, when we have very few training examples, set fit is a better model. But after that, the transformer is getting better and the set fit has this plateau of performance. Um, however, if we look at the last line, so we can see that on the second step, our model is better than the transformer. And it's much um, cheaper computationally because it does not uh, need to be retrained. Yeah, and the results that I'm showing here is just on a single data set, which is the hate spew, the speech offensive uh, data set, um, since uh, we are still running experiments on a larger benchmark. So the results are in this sense indicative, but they are also a bit preliminary to make uh, general conclusions. Now I'm going to move to the second uh, part of this uh, detect, debunk, communicate pipeline. And uh, now that I've discussed some work on how to detect uh, false claims, I would like to talk about how we can check claims and then verify or debunk them. So um, here we have done some analysis of the claims that we find in one of the popular PolitiFact uh, data sets uh, that has over 20,000 claims. And what you can see here is the distribution among false, mixed, and true claims uh, plotted over the years. So one immediate trend can be seen immediately, and in particular since uh, 2018, roughly, uh, the number of false claims in the data set, so the claims fact-checked by real fact-checkers, is rising quite uh, steeply. So that means that we have more false claims uh, appearing in real-life data, and the work of fact-checkers is becoming ever harder because they need to debunk a very large number of false claims. So that's why uh, recognizing and debunking false claims becomes very um, important. So how do we define actually 
uh, real world misinformation. We define it as non true harmful claims that professional fact checkers deem important to verify. And there are two uh, properties uh, which are important to point, out, uh, to point out here. So first, this uh, the volume. So how do fact checkers decide which claims to check? Right, because the number of claims can be indefinite, uh, indefinitely high, but the resources are limited. So we need to prioritize uh, the work. So uh, the volume decides if this is a claim that is spread a lot and many people um, have heard of it. So uh, we don't want to put our attention on unknown claims, but we want to uh, check claims that uh, receive the attention of many people. And the second criterion that the fact checkers uh, are using is relevance. That is, what is the potential uh, relevance and damage to the society if such a claim goes unchecked. So these are two criteria how they optimize um, the fact checking work. Now I have this uh, example play. Uh, Coldplay is French, so Coldplay is a, is, a, is a band, right? So this is one claim. I have another example. Half a million sharks could be killed to make a COVID-19 vaccine. I have a, the third one. Uh, Beat It is not a song by Michael uh, Jackson. And uh, um, I'd like to ask uh, the audience here <laughs> uh, this question. So which one is... Uh, the case of real world misinformation and of course why so what do you think given these three claims and the definition that i just uh, given so which one is the real world misinformation sharks so why do you think so because i lived in the 80s and michael jackson in new york and it was very, uh, maybe, that's correct, maybe. Uh, you bought the frosty and the, the, the privacy connection. Yeah. So any other opinions or reasons to yeah. think? I think there, is, there was something. some news about using something from sharks uh, to extract to, to make vaccines. So it, it's, it's something that you could believe might be true, whereas the others are uh, um, contradictory statements that you can say, well, that's, that's directly opposite to true. So it provides ambiguity. Okay, thank you. Very good. Anything else? Okay, is that, is that enough? Is that enough, uh, our opinion? Or, or you want to take our opinion and put it in the system? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to um, you to understand where the current state of the art in NLP fails. Why is it so? Uh, because your answer is, of course, right. So this is an example of uh, real life misinformation. So this is a claim which was taken from a fact checking website. So this is something a fact checker has prioritized for checking. The other two examples um, are taken from a state of the art NLP data set for fact checking. And what you can see here is that uh, these examples in our data sets uh, do not correspond to the reality, right? And I was asking about the reasons and um, yeah, the reasons uh, that you have collectively provided, I mean, they're very good reasons. Um, and in addition, we can uh, say that the first two statements, right? So these are uh, so-called synthetic claims from a very popular fever data set, which is our common benchmark for fact checking, <laughs> they are created artificially, right? In crowdsourcing, people are given sentences from Wikipedia and they need to restate this as a claim. And what you see here is that a real claim is much more complex, right? And you see the deficiency of the state of the art to, um, because it does not generalize from such synthetic example and uh, examples and um, fails um, on the real life Data. So uh, the real life is half a million sharks could be killed to make COVID-19 vaccine. And it's also appealing to our emotion, right? So the nature of claim is different because uh, we feel there's some relation to what is like going on. Um, and the other things are kind of factual. So you don't even know why 
like a large audience could be interested in this kind of uh, statement. So there are certain attributes uh, common to harmful real world misinformation uh, that the current data sets in NLP do not actually um, capture well. So they are far from uh, the reality. So now you know already uh, two claims are taken from the FIBER uh, data set and the other one is from the fact checking website. And um, the next thing I want to uh, think about together with you is why this harmful real world misinformation so challenging, what makes it actually difficult uh, to debunk this claim? So what do you think? Uh, the verb could be yes, very difficult to disprove. Yes, so it's kind of like uh, a scenario you can imagine, right? But it's not like a fact you can look up. No way to look it up, right? So that's uh, one uh, big difficulty. Now imagine um, this uh, claim would be true, right? So that claim would be true. What would be different in checking the information? So if the claim were true, right? So you would think that there exists, for example, some scientific literature about uh, how COVID vaccines are created and you can just look up the information and maybe put the pieces together, you know, so you can use a search engine. But if a claim is false, um, it's much more difficult since uh, nobody has published on that. <laughs> You understand what I mean? So uh, um, we lack negative evidence uh, for this uh, false claim. So if you are verifying the information, the task is easy. So you can hopefully find it in a large corpus of document. However, if the claim is false, we have no counter evidence. So we need to collect some other more distant pieces of knowledge and somehow reason about them in order to conclude that this claim is wrong. So um, it's a much harder task. And this is actually why I crossed out verify. So the verification is the main paradigm used in fact checking. And this is because we work with this synthetic uh, data, which is kind of rephrasing claims from Wikipedia, statements from Wikipedia, but debunking is a much uh, more difficult task. So I have an example how. Um, a fact check is doing this work. So we have this hydroxylochloroquin cures COVID-19 claim that we already have seen in the uh, tweet example in the very beginning. And the first thing is that there is no counter evidence for this. However, the NLP system rely heavily on the evidence. So they retrieve like a search engine pieces of evidence and then they make a prediction, however, for false claims, when a false claim enters, you know, the social media, there is no counter evidence you can retrieve. So the paradigm does not work. So what do the fact checkers do? So first thing, they are looking who is making this claim. So the question of credibility. So here, that's the tea party. So that party might have been already known for spreading false information or being involved in some conspiracy theories, right? So that gives the fact checker a lot of information how to reason about the claim. So this is uh, something which is kind of more general uh, world knowledge. And uh, what fact, fact checkers do, or journalists, uh, they try to make contact with the person. So this is something a computer cannot do. However, the, the implication for the NLP task, though we cannot contact the person, maybe we could figure out at least whom to contact in order to, um, uh, to gain more evidence about a specific case. And finally, uh, there was this uh, study which came together with the claim, the fact checkers would look into the study and uh, they will find out that the study is actually irrelevant uh, to this claim because the study is from 2005. So at that time there was no coronavirus, right? So this uh, study 
um, it's not relevant to the claim. It was a different virus and those were in vitro experiments. So this is just to illustrate how different the process of a fact checker is from what NLP systems, uh, state-of-the-art NLP systems for fact checking do. Because uh, what they do is that they use a search engine, they look for relevant document, they extract evidence snippets, and then they somehow make a prediction based on this evidence if the claim is true or false. However, you cannot map it uh, to the real life scenarios and especially to false claims in the lack of counter evidence as I illustrated. So <clears throat> our uh, Research question here, basically in this analysis, is how to create more realistic task definitions and data sets for NLP-based fact-checking. It involves various aspects. So the first, we want to focus the research on checkworthy and real-world misinformation. So for example, the claim you get free coffee for smashing shatterproof uh, Starbucks windows from a current NLP data set. So multi-FC data set, which is uh, very common in this area of research. So it's not very checkworthy from our point of view. Um, and then uh, for the evidence, we want evidence to be realistic. It means the evidence should be unleaked. However, when we look inside the current data sets, they um, contain leaked evidence. So they contain, because they are created by a search engine, information crawled from fact-checking websites like Snopes, and that leaks already um, uh, the evidence. So it's an unrealistic uh, scenario. And the last, it should be, the evidence should be sufficient and it should be relevant. So our data sets contain statements like an explosion damaged a sidewalk bench and shattered windows at a Starbucks, which is somehow relevant to the claim. However, it's not sufficient uh, to make a conclusion about uh, the veracity of the claim. So in our study, we analyzed uh, all existing uh, data sets that we could find about fact checking with these uh, three criteria that I've described. And we uh, conclude that we don't have a realistic data set for fact checking in NL NLP that, uh, uh, that uh, complies with our uh, criteria. Either false claims are generated based on real world uh, true claims. So, uh, by means of paraphrasing, uh, for example, or paraphrasing search user um, uh, queries. Um, and this is not representative of the real world uh, misinformation. So the sample that we have has properties different from the uh, actual target task. Or we have pro uh, problems with evidence. So the evidence is either insufficient in order to make a prediction or the evidence is leaked because uh, the data that we call from the web with the search engines already contains an answer. So it makes it like a kind of answer retrieval problem, but not really fact checking. So my group has contributed to two of such uh, data sets. I don't have time to go into details, but for people who are interested in this area, I can talk more about it. So as a case study, we provide an in-depth analysis uh, for one of the popular uh, data sets, MultiFC. And uh, here we collect claims from multiple fact-checking websites and uh, the evidence is collected with the help of uh, the Google search engine. And as a gold standard, they use verdicts from professional uh, fact-checkers. So the question we look at is how many claims have leaked evidence? So our only focus is false claims, which is 50% of the data set, 16,000 claims. And we use two heuristics in order to identify leaked evidence. One of them is uh, via the URL. We are checking if it's pointing to a fact-checking website already, so to the article containing the answer. And the other is we are looking if the text contra contains certain keywords like fact-check. Um, and uh, we manually verified that uh, the two heuristics have high precision. And we find that in this data set, state-of-the-art NLP data set, uh, there is leaked evidence in 60% of all claims. And then we check the remaining 40% of the claims. So what do we find? Uh, it turns out they have severe evidence problems. 
we manually checked the cases where the heuristics did not find anything, and most of them either have not helpful evidence, so this is the yellow part, 50%, or it has leaked evidence, this is the red part, which was not detected by the heuristics. And actually only uh, two out of 50 uh, contain um, an unleaked evidence, which is relevant and which is useful and which also has a negative stance. Remember the negative stance is especially important for uh, finding the counter evidence. And this is a very tiny proportion of the evidence which is contained in this data set. So the data set is basically flawed in a sense. Um, it was uh, found in some prior work by Hansen and Al last year. It's not our finding that the claim is actually irrelevant to performance for current models. What does it mean? It means that um, we can predict uh, the veracity of the claim without looking at the claim by using large language models just based on the evidence. And here you have a comparison of leaked and unleaked because we uh, can identify uh, leaked evidence with our heuristics. You see that the results for unleaked are significantly worse. And then we repeat that experiment where we predict the veracity just based on evidence, not looking at the claim at all, which does not make much sense. And we see that these trends remain persistent also in the other um, data sets. So uh, the way how evidence is represented in our data sets is really very flawed and is not representative of the fact checking task. So what to do in the future? That's basically the main result of this more analysis oriented uh, research. So I believe that uh, we need to uh, redefine the task of fact checking, and we need to have a more fine grained modeling of the task. So, this is this complex table I'm not going uh, into uh, details about. So, it's from the work by others. But basically, what they propose is that we need to focus on different types of claims. And for those, we need to have uh, clean definitions, and we need to develop approaches that can tackle particular types of claims and phenomena and also subtasks of the more complex fact checking uh, checking task because the task as such is an expert task and is currently it it does not um amend itself well uh, to the nlp technology that we have so we need to go in small steps rather incrementally and uh, create data sets for the particular um partial steps that we find in this complex workflow. Now, um, as I mentioned, there are uh, two papers from our lab describing the more realistic data sets that we in the meanwhile have also criticized, but they have some nice properties just uh, as a pointer for people interested in that. Now I move to the last part of my talk, uh, how to effectively communicate against misinformation. That is how can we present these results uh, to people and be uh, persuasive about that. So for example, how can we convince an anti-vaxxer to finally get uh, vaccinated? So it's a very difficult uh, task because people do not respond well just to facts if they are presenting uh, presented uh, to people in a generic way. So how can we uh, use NLP support in order to effectively communicate against misinformation? We are involved in an ongoing uh, collaboration with psychologists and cognitive scientists, um, in a group of Professor Lewandowski uh, at the University of Bristol. It's uh, an ERC advanced grant. And in this work, they create a taxonomy and a text data set of anti-vaxxer attitude wounds. Which, are also, uh, which we also performed text modeling on to classify the root. Now, what is the attitude root? Here's the definition. An attitude root is underlying fears, worldviews, identity needs that sustain and motivate, motivate specific surface opinions of the public. Let me give you an example taken from Stefan's work. Um, so we have the statement, we can't trust information from Big Pharma about vaccines. So um, 
we want to change the mind of a person who um, has produced um, the statement or we want to prevent other people from being deceived by this misinformation. So um, once we have uh, determined what is the attitude root behind this statement, we can uh, start to address the attitude root with a custom um, targeted rebuttal. So here, for example, the attitude root underlying the statement is distrust related to the perception of hidden motives. For example, vaccines only made for profit. So that's the inner belief that the person producing uh, the statement has. Um, after identification of the attitude root, so given the statement we classify this as distrust, the next step is to affirm uh, that root. In particular, we could say that COVID-19 vaccines were profitable for the pharmaceutical um, industry. So that's their concern. And definitely, it's not nonsense to be skeptical about the motives of these massive um, industries. And now in the last step, after we have confirmed uh, this concern, we turn the attitude route against the anti-vaxxer and turn their argument on its head. It would be far more profitable for big pharma to keep selling us treatments forever rather than create uh, vaccines. So they could earn much more money if uh, people would get sick uh, with uh, COVID-19. And also scientists work hard to ensure that vaccines are uh, safe and many scientists have concluded that vaccines provide good protection against severe illness from COVID-19 with very little side effects. So by identifying the root automatically, um, we want to create a tool that can be um, utilized by psychologists in order to create such targeted rebuttals that Con, uh, respond to hidden concerns of those people. So the attitude roots are obviously very important for refuting the argument of an anti-vaxxer. And um, in our related ongoing work, we are also researching the automation of responding to an anti-vaxxer in a way that acknowledges their attitude. So we want to form a counter argument that addresses the specific concern of that uh, person and does not respond generically. So here you can see some examples of the attitude truths and the labels that we have uh, in our data set, just to give you some you know, general impression. It's uh, like conspiracy ideation, distrust. We have already seen unwarranted belief, worldview, fear and phobias, morality concerns, and so on. So there are 11 categories and two data sets have been created in this work by uh, the psychologists in collaboration with us. The first data set was constructed by performing a comprehensive literature review of 20 years of psychological works on vaccine hesitancy. So these are scientific papers and we have extracted text from those articles and analyzed uh, the attitude roots of the arguments. And the second data set is scraped from the web by labeling fact-checking articles that rebut uh, anti-vaxxer uh, arguments uh, regarding COVID-19. So what you can see here, the main takeaway, though these data sets are quite different in nature, but uh, the label distribution is somewhat similar. Um, and also distrust, fear and phobias and unwarranted belief are the dominating labels in both uh, data sets. Now, on the modeling side, uh, the question is, can we use our tools like SetFit that I've introduced in the first part of the presentation to identify attitude routes automatically? And we experiment with SetFit as compared to majority baseline, random baseline, a large language model, and a sentence transformer plus logistic regression. And we see that in this experiment, the set fit uh, performs uh, very strongly. But can we do better? So the question is, can we prime set fit with more knowledge? And here we conduct two experiments. So the first is we use the expert knowledge 
from the first data set of scientific literature and we leverage this knowledge to identify the attitude root in the second data set from fact-checking articles. So we pre-train our classifiers on the first data set, then we freeze them and we perform a zero-shot classification on the second one. Uh, so basically we just do the classification on the second um, data set and see if the knowledge can transfer at all. And the answer is yes, we can achieve some knowledge transfer. So what if we perform a two-step fine-tuning where the first where we first fine tune on data set one, and then we continue on data set two. And we see that the results get much, much higher. So they are really strong and they have a nice interpretation that we can prime set fit with expert psychological uh, knowledge and identify attitude roots in more complex um, text taken from the web. And here is a nice visualization um, how this annotation scheme um, can be separated by our model. So you can see the really colored clusters of different labels uh, that we have in our uh, data set and they can be nicely separated uh, by the model. So just to summarize, I've presented these three steps, detecting false claims, that was the first part. Then uh, debunking, it was the analysis part about the current NLP data sets. And the last is about how to identify attitude truths and uh, counter um, false arguments. So in our future uh, work, we have two projects that uh, we are about to start. So the first one, we want to construct a larger data set of misrepresented signs. Where this example of the tweet pointing to a scientific study was indicative of that. So there are many more such uh, false claims. And the second is we also want to move to exploring and generalizing our work on multimodal uh, content. So we have text and image, for example, and we want to have an approach that can respond and rebat multimodal um, anti vaxxer memes. So this is, of course, an ambitious. Uh, goal that requires a lot more research. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Are ready for one one talk? Questions? That's not a long question. Uh, so we have a text question. I didn't my glasses, so I have to walk a long way away from myself. Uh, uh, from Kartik, my question is philosophical. Is it really possible to label something as misinformation or harmful in certainty? Going back to the so called harmful example we'll provided at the beginning, uh, the government will discriminate against the un unvaccinated. Uh, I would argue that everything in the sentence is factual. Uh, one, most governments around the world indeed discriminate against the unvaccinated. Two, uh, most governments took away, so it's a, a long comment, uh, two, most governments uh, took away the rights of unvaccinated. Three, I can personally attest that at least two governments did send infected people to so-called COVID camps, uh, which are not very different from prison camps. So <laughs> the question was, is it really possible to label something as uh, misinformation or, or harmful, given that context? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's really kind of an open research question. I mean, a typical approach in NLP is that you have uh, several people coding the data and then you measure inter annotator agreement. Um, that's the dominating paradigm. I personally think this paradigm does not ex uh, imply uh, to expert domains because in expert domains, you very often have a situation that people disagree and they have their own reasons to disagree because they also have maybe different knowledge uh, that they use. So there's uh, no truth in the sense, but there are different perspectives on, on this. Um, so I think it's definitely possible to quantify the amount of disagreement in people. Uh, but people do have an opinion about that. So, and I think that the system could kind of try to model this diversity of opinions in a way, you know, so if for particular examples, there exists different perspective, the ideal system would try to model this diversity of opinions. So on the one hand, on the other hand, I could envisage like approaches that 
can support this particular ex expert, you know, so it's more in a personalized way, not claiming this is the general truth, because as I said, and that's why my first slide, no truth exists, so it's not about the truth, but to help the work of this expert, we can kind of figure out the strategies they use in order to classify the examples this or that way, and we can try to create tools that support this particular workflow, so that's my view on this philosophical issue. Questions? Thank you, it's a really interesting talk. Um, the example you gave about sharks is really a speculation about the future, and you labeled it as a misinformation, but I could construct something very similar, which I think, well, it's appeared on the BBC website, which is supposedly a reliable use of it. I could say something like half a million people may die if Putin uses tactical nuclear weapons or something like that. And it has a very similar format. And thinking about the two examples, I guess if you wanted to say one was misinformation and the other was not, what you're looking at is the kind of presuppositions behind the statement. It's not about verification, it's about getting at that. Maybe that's what the project with people crystal is about. It's about a set of presuppositions that underlie the statement. So making them explicit. So I think, for yeah. example, trying to and explicate them. Presumably, if you are happy with the BBC statements, then you have to say, well, he has those weapons and he could use them. But actually, to make COVID vaccines, you don't need charts. Um, so one is really this information, the other is uh, it's, it's, it's uh, um, a speculation about the future. It's not verifiable or not, but the underlying presuppositions are now in some sense verifiable. Is, would that be the, the, is that another way of phrasing what you're trying to do with people in or do you think it's actually more complicated than that? So the Bristol is just about like, rebutting the argument, so it's not related to this uh, um, data set analysis work. These are two separate lines of work. But so we already have a, kind of a manually collected data set of false arguments that we use in this case study with Bristol, right? So we are not looking at this in the wild. So that's the main difference. But your question is about more the data in the wild. And I think it's a truly like um, excellent point, that it's extremely hard to distinguish uh, these two categories and also how realistic is the future uh, scenario. So that would be even much more difficult uh, question. And I think that the role of NLP tools can be to help uh, people explicate the presuppositions in order to make an informed uh, judgment. But this judgment is in itself is a very difficult expert task. So I think the current NLP cannot capture that. For sure. Yeah. And I completely agree with you that the impact of the existing data sets are a sort of an unrealistically narrow version of the. Yeah, so they are off topic, you know, as far as fact checking is concerned. I mean, this is all great work, and I'm also part of it. Uh, in NLP, we try to simplify the tasks, uh, you know, in order to make them uh, kind of. Uh, operational in the NLP domain, but in this case, the task is uh, so much simplified that it violates some very fundamental assumptions uh, in that domain, so it becomes unrealistic and it's not very useful, you know, because, for example, the, uh, the assumption to rely on existing evidence, it just doesn't hold for false claims, which very often do not have any evidence at all, and then this whole issue of credibility which probably also goes beyond NLP because to derive credibility, you also need to look at network structure of inter interaction and these kind of things. So it's beyond the text level. I had a question about uh, leakage at uh, um, the second part of the talk. So um, because you were talking about it, uh, in part in the context of uh, pre-trained language models, they used to have leakage in the URLs, uh, but separate things, they used to have leakage in the, um, the evidence. So, so given the lack of transparency in many cases in what training data pre-trained language models are trained over and 
you know, kind of the um, establishing, I, I guess, temporal uh, um, disjointedness between you know, kind of what the prefect language model is trained off versus uh, the facts, and also, I guess, the nature of the facts. Um, so, uh, yeah, some of them uh, have a, a sort of clear uh, time point associated with so it's something like, I don't know, uh, cold play was uh, um, formed in 1973 or sort of something like that. And okay. Uh, I, I, if that's the case, I should be able to go back to studies and really find the evidence of it. Um, whereas if it's, it's called like French, it's not so sort of clear exactly at what point uh, I should be able to um, uh, validate or otherwise that claim. But so that the interface between some pre, pre trained language models, the training data they've used, and this sort of chronological constraint that you're assuming, how do we uh, establish that? You know, how, how do we sort of validate this question of the um, Yeah, it's a very difficult question, you know. So the whole temporal dimension, especially in checking some information, so what has been like true yesterday is not true today, you know. Yeah. So this dimension is completely ignored by existing data sets. So I have some work on uh, temporality in language models, but uh, the amount of data sets existing for that is even less than for fact checking in general. So I think the data is kind of a major um, bottleneck. So it's a big challenge in NLP because and machine learning relies crucially on the data and the data is unavailable or it's very biased. And now that we have all these legal and ethical considerations in NLP <laughs> in using the data, it's becoming <laughs> more and more impossible to create a data set uh, at all. So uh, I'm afraid I don't have like any concrete yeah. answer. It's yeah. a very open yeah. research question. I think that temporal dimension needs to be considered in uh, this kind of research because for facts, they have temporal uh, fluidity, yeah. definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a simple heuristic uh, for printability, you know. So once I had an example where something ha happened in the Gaza uh, area, uh, you know, and I have some uh, people from different countries, including Israel, and I had two different sources, a source from Israel and uh, an Arabic source. And basically, we have been discussing this example back and forth. So can we conclude the claim given this evidence or not? And then somebody in the audience said, so it's not about the fact, the facts, it's basically who you believe. <laughs> right? So credibility is a very important dimension, which is not considered so far. So that's the point I was making that the problem of fact checking, it's very, very complex. You know, it's a very difficult uh, expert problem that involves all this. And the fact checkers are trained for that. But the models um, do not have access to this kind of information. But the source would be definitely very helpful, um, I think, as one of the indicators. So this is just one indicator. Since, you know, for some sources, the data is very carefully verified before it's published. For other sources, the quality can be very uh, bad. And then there's, in the social media the domain, all this like interaction data, which is highly predictive, you know, behavioral data of credibility, but uh, where no good data sets exist, where text data is combined with this type of data, you know, so that's also like a big difficulty because many problems involve not only the text dimension, but other uh, dimensions. And then it's, it, it becomes much harder to, to create data sets in order to be able to work on such a problem. Okay, thank you very much again, Irene, for a fascinating talk. You're doing